And now we're finally ready to state Newton's second law in formal mathematical terms using all of the vector algebra and calculus that we have uh, set up so far. So Newton's second law tells us that the resultant force on particle P is a vector quantity, and it is going to be equal to the derivative with respect to an inertial frame of the linear momentum, which itself is an inertially defined quantity of the particle P with respect to a point O, which is a non-accelerating point in the inertial frame. The linear momentum itself is defined as the product of the mass of the particle with the inertial velocity of the particle. The velocity is the inertial derivative of the position of the particle with respect to that point. So we give it a left superscript just as if we were doing the differentiation because we have to differentiate to get this quantity. And we carry that left superscript into our linear momentum P definition to remind us that this is an inertial quantity. If we make the assumption that the mass is constant in time, we can pull it out of this differential operator. And then we get mass, the mass of a particle times the inertial derivative of the inertial velocity, which is the inertial acceleration of the particle with respect to that non-accelerating term O. Okay. So O can be inertially fixed, or it can be moving at a constant velocity with respect to the inertial frame. It does not matter. Because we are getting to the acceleration where we've taken the second derivative, any constant velocity will just differentiate away. And so it does not make any difference. All reference frames moving with respect to one another at constant velocity are mutually inertial. Any two frames that are mutually rotating with one another even if they're not accelerating in translation, they have to be accelerating because there's a mutual acceleration to their unit vectors. And so any two frames that are rotating with respect to one another, if one of them is inertial, the other one cannot be inertial. But what does it mean to be inertial? This is one of the biggest gaps in the Principia and, and um, in our understanding of Newton's laws. Inertial effectively means that your reference frame is not significantly accelerating with respect to the system that you're analyzing. And that significantly is, is kind of key here because everything is accelerating with respect to everything else. Everything is moving with respect to everything else. And so our best bet is to just find a reference frame that is still enough for the purposes of a given problem. And so when we are doing dynamics on the surface of the earth, we tend to ignore the rotation of the earth and so we get to scales where it becomes important, like weather systems. But then when we're talking about a spacecraft orbiting the Earth, clearly we cannot have an inertial reference frame fixed, anchored to the Earth that is itself rotating because the spacecraft is moving around the Earth and then that, that's a significant mutual acceleration. So instead we can define a reference frame anchored to the center of the Earth that is not rotating with the Earth. And we will call that inertial. However, the Earth is rotating around the sun. And so for a spacecraft in orbit around the Earth, that doesn't make a huge difference. But in a spacecraft in interstellar space, clearly that's a huge difference. And so now we move our reference frame and say we put it at the center of mass of the sun. And that works for a while too. And then that breaks down as we get to another level of required fidelity. And then we move our reference frame to be inertially fixed at the barycenter, center of mass of the whole solar system, and so on and so on. So every single level of problem has a certain level of abstraction to it that motivates our choice of what we can easily defend as an inertial reference frame. So here now, finally, we have the statement of Newton's second law. We can also have an angular version of it, where we basically cross all of the components of this with the position vector of our particle, again, with respect to that same point O. And so the angular form of Newton's second law, there's no new physics here. This is just some vector algebra happening. It tells us that the net moment or the torque of our particle on our particle about O is going to be equal to the inertial time derivative of the inertial angular momentum of the particle about point O. And this quantity is defined as the position of P with respect to O crossed with the linear momentum of P with respect to O. And the net moment works out to be the cross product of the position of the particle with the resultant force of the particle. So, this is what is commonly known as the linear momentum balance, and this is what is commonly known as the angular momentum balance. And for some systems, you can solve them entirely just using one set of equations, and for other systems, and in particular three-dimensional rigid bodies, you 100% need both sets of expressions in order to get to your final solution. Newton's second law 
and in fact, all of Newton's laws formally only apply to point masses, to individual part infinitesimal particles. And, and remember, Newtonian particles are not physical objects. They're not atoms. They're not molecules. They have no real physical analogs. They are complete mathematical abstractions. They are mass, quantities of mass, located at a single point in space, infinitesimal point in space. They do not have extent. And because of that, it actually requires a little bit of mathematical effort in order to expand Newton's laws to apply to extended bodies. But in the case of the linear momentum balance, it's relatively straightforward to show that collections of particles together, either rigidly or non-rigidly attached, behave in terms of linear momentum balance, just like a single particle located at the center of mass of the system, which we call G. And so Newton's second law becomes Euler's first law, and really, there's nothing here. There's nothing added here. There's there's no new physics added here. It's essentially a restatement and a, a very quick mathematical proof to show that a, a collection of particles can be treated as a single particle with the total mass of the whole collection. However, when you get to the angular momentum balance, it's a little bit of a different story. Just to knock out the easy part of this, you will recall that the center of mass is defined as the mass weighted average of all of the positions of the individual constituent parts of your collection of particles. So here, mg is the sum of all of the masses m sub i. So mg is the summation from i equals 1 to n of all of the individual m sub i's. And so we take the mass weighted average of the positions of each particle with respect to some inertially fixed or inertially non-accelerating point O, and we divide by the total sum, and we get the position of G with respect to that point O. O can actually be anything, but again, because we want to use this for Newton's laws, it should be a non-accelerating point. If you then take your collection and allow it to represent a rigid body, such that you take the total number of particles to go to infinity and the mass of each individual particle to go to zero, then this exactly describes how you get from a summation to a continuous integral. And so you can write the position of the center of mass with respect to some point O of a rigid or extended body as, again, the mass weighted integral over the body of all the positions of the constituent mass elements, dm of the body with respect to O, integrated over dm. If you have a density function where this is rho as a function of the position, so this is not rho times rdm rho, this is rho as a function of the position of each mass element, then you can turn this mass integral into a volume integral. And furthermore, if rho is constant, if rho, if the body is, is constant density, then you can pull this out and stick it here outside of the integrand. From this, we can also show very quickly that the definition of the center of mass implies that the mass average, the mass weighted average, or the mass weighted sum of the positions of each constituent particle with respect to the center of mass is zero. That is why the center of mass is special. It's special because of effectively this mathematical statement. And again, as you take things to an infinite number of particles, you get this integral form of what is commonly known as the center of mass corollary. So this is just formalities that allow us to treat a rigid body or a collection of particles as a single megaparticle with the total mass of the collection located at the center of mass of the collection or body. And then Newton's second law just applies and Euler calls it his first law and, and it's fine. Um, there's nothing else to be said about the linear momentum balance. But on the angular momentum side, things get kind of interesting. So let's think about the net angular momentum of a collection of particles about some point O, which we will represent as H sub O. Based on our previous definition, this will be the, the position of each of the particles crossed with the linear momentum of each of the particles. So we just rearrange this a little bit such the, so that the, the MI comes out here. And so again, as we take MI to go to an infinitesimal value and the number of particles to go to infinity, we can rewrite this summation as an integral. And so everything that we do here can be done in integral form. We're just going to keep it in summation form because it's a little more legible that way. All right. So we take the derivative of this in order to apply in the second law or the angular form of it, and we get a lot of terms. So if this is just differentiating this based on product rule. And so we will have one term that looks very much like what we have for the single particle case, where we have the position of each of the particles crossed with the external forces 
on each of the particles. And this we call the external moment. This is the net external moment on the collection. And then you have to account for all of the internal forces. And so we will describe this as Fi sub j, where Fi or Fi comma j represents the force on particle i due to particle j. And so you have all of this stuff. Now, when we do this exercise for the linear momentum balance and we split forces into external forces and internal forces, all of the internal forces, the summation over all the internal forces will cancel out, will go to zero because of Newton's third law, because all the internal forces have to have equal and opposite counterparts for a collection of particles. However, you can define a set of forces where this term here does not go to zero. And so the only bit of physics that is different between Euler's laws and Newton's laws is that Euler's second law posits that this term is exactly zero for rigid bodies, that there are no internal forces that can produce non-zero term when particles are rigidly attached to one another, as in a rigid body. However, for a non-rigidly attached collection of particles, it is absolutely possible to define a force. It's not very common to encounter such forces, but it is 100% physical to have a force where this whole thing does not go to zero. And so the assumption that this equals zero is sometimes called the internal moment assumption, and it is fundamentally baked into Euler's second law, which just says the time derivative of the angular momentum of a rigid body about some point O is equal to the external torque about O on that body. We can go even further and introduce something called the separation principle, where we are going to split H sub O, the total angular momentum of the rigid body about that point O, into two pieces. One of the pieces will be the angular momentum of the center of mass of the body G about that point O. And it says inertially fixed point, but this can also be inertially non-accelerating point. And the second piece of this is going to be the angular momentum of the body about its own center of mass. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about a blob that's moving through space and also rotating about its own center of mass. And so this describes the moving through space part, the rotating about this point O. And this piece, H sub G, just describes the local rotation of the body about its own center of mass. And for the majority of the time, when we're talking about rigid bodies, we really kind of just care about this H sub G. The neat thing is that we can apply Euler's second law independently to each of those pieces and get two independent sets of equations. And as I said, we really just care about the differential equations associated with H sub G, the angular momentum of the body about its own center of mass. So H sub G for a collection of particles is just defined as the summation over all of the um, positions of each particle across with their linear momenta. And again, for continuous bodies, you can take the limit and turn this into an integral. And then the derivative of H sub G will be equal to the external torque about G. And this gets a little bit tricky because the external torque is going to be different based on whether you have contact forces or field forces or both. So contact forces are exactly what they sound like. Contact forces are forces that are acting on a specific point in your body. They're a thrust force, they're an impact force, they're anything that has a specific point of contact or point of application. Field forces are things like gravity that affect all aspects of your body at the same time. And so to treat a field force for a rigid body, you have to integrate over the entirety of the body uh, the specific force. So this lowercase f, the m, is the specific force, the force scaled by the mass. And uh, for contact forces, you just sum up the moments due to each contact force where I, in this case, is the location of the contact force, and N, in this case, is the number of the contact forces. So that's really the only thing to be careful about. But otherwise, you get back to having six sets of differential equations that describe the six degrees of freedom that a 3D rigid body in three-dimensional space naturally possesses.